Hello, I'm Matthias Schweighöfer and I play Ludwig Dieter in Army of the Dead. I hope you're enjoying Justice Con. And I can't wait to share the film with you next month. And <laughs> I'm so excited what you guys think about my finishing dance moves. Hello, <laughs> guys. Hello. That was awesome. Matthias, uh, who plays Dieter in the upcoming Army of the Dead movie. Um, but yeah. This is me, Fatma, and I'm going to be hosting this awesome panel with Deborah and Wesley. And yeah, so it's finally here. We're closing in to Army of the Dead. How are you guys feeling about it? And, you know, how is it like to finally start talking about it in this way? Uh, it's, it's really amazing. I mean, I think the whole project for us, um, you know, we had taken some time off. So... Uh, we were really excited to do, you know, this movie and this movie in particular was something that we had had started and stopped a few times. So this was the right time, I think, to have it and, um, you know, working on it um, just in all aspects has been really an incredible uh, process for us. And now I think for fans that the fact they're going to see it soon, um, you know, we're really excited about that. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I think for me, it's exciting because we've been immersed in a particular universe for a long time. And and so now to have this this tonal shift and these these new characters to be talking about, there's there's just a lot of really exciting stuff. And also, I think the way Zach approached it and his role in the film opened a lot of creative doors in terms of our overall process making the film. And so it's been a really fun experience. And, and like you had said, it's great to be at this point where now we get to start talking about it and sharing, because we've been living with it for a long time. So it's, yeah. it's great to start to be able to share it with people. By the way, especially the trailer, because we had the trailer, I think, finished in the fall at some point. And we worked backwards. We had the trailer first, and then we did the teaser. And we were so excited about you know what the trailer was that it was really hard to get to a teaser because we didn't want to give too much away and we didn't want to steal too much from that. And um, and then it was just sitting there. And I remember I couldn't wait for to, to release it, you know. Um, That's awesome, because like you've been, you, as you said before, you've been working on this from 2007. So what are the, what was the process of finally getting it and getting it to to Netflix and the choice of getting it to Netflix in particular? So how was it like for you guys as producers, perhaps, and 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 that journey? Um, well, as I said, when we first developed this, it was right after Zach did a Dawn of the Dead, and he had this idea of like upping the ante and wouldn't Vegas if Dawn of the Dead was set in a shopping mall, like isn't Vegas like the best metaphor for zombies? <laughs> like, I don't even know that it is a metaphor. Um, there probably is a lot of zombies in Vegas, although a lot of fun things too uh, in <laughs> Vegas. I don't wanna be, I don't wanna be like talking negatively about Vegas. Um, but, uh, you know, I think at the time he didn't feel like he could just direct another one. So it was developed for another director. Um, but the budget was really big because you had to create this post-apocalyptic world and masses of zombies, like all that makeup costs money. Um, and it was, I think it was either a first or second time director. So, you know, it was at a budget level that no one felt comfortable. And it was also at, at a point where it was not a huge movie, like World War Z, I think was out at the time, which had huge spectacle, but it also wasn't a small, movie and we felt like where it sat it, it couldn't deliver on the spectacle but yet it had a bigger budget so we said you know what this isn't the right time to do it and we shelved it and it sat around and then zach started recently thinking like well what if we like went back to this and i remember we had a meeting with scott stuber over at netflix and ori marmer and um they were saying well what do you what do you got what do you got? And, you know, we were talking about a lot of things and ARMY came up and they were like, what, you have this? Like, we want to do this. And then Zach said, well, listen, if, you know, I can share the script, but if I want to rewrite it because, you know, it was kind of developed for another director, Joby Harold did the first script and he did an amazing screenplay, but it wasn't, you know, every director wants to make it their own. 
So um, Zach really wanted to make it his own. And we, uh, you know, we, we worked on the script, but they had such faith in it that they wanted to shoot over the summer. I think, when was that? Uh, March, Wes? Yeah, yep. So they said, okay, we're gonna work on the script at the same time as the movie. And it wasn't gonna be really quick. We were supposed to be done with the movie, you know, in June and the movie would have come out in January. Um, but then we had the additional photography, so it kind of delayed things. Um, so that's kind of the the process, you know, that that we went to get it to where it is. Yeah. And we, we've always talked about too as a company that we we tend not to develop a ton of things. We we have our our you know the slate of ideas that we're really in love with, um, and we and we have an intention to make all of them. Uh, so we don't have, you know, this this pile of things that we may pick or choose from, but we have things that we, we've fallen in love with and, and, you know, we're okay with waiting for that right time. Like Debbie said, I think that there's a million reasons why something plays in a certain moment or there's an appetite for, or has additional relevance. And so we're, you know, we pick things we really love and, and we wait for the window for those things to have their moment. And, and it's exciting to have something, I, I think I, I'd said it before, but I think something that comes from a Zach idea, it's always so fun to play in that world because you know I, I think that as a storyteller, he always has such unique perspective on things and his vision to bring those things to life is always always fun to be tasked with that. It was also I mean, fun to create an, you know, after working on all the DC um, projects for so long, which has like a very rich canon, to create something new and to do that same level of world building Absolutely. with something that's original, you're kind of unencumbered by everything. And it's it's really exciting because you're really creating something from nothing. And that's and that's something that I think is such a great thing with Zach Snyder and like you guys in general is is the ability to build something. So um with that question, um, you know, the world building, you've got the anime coming up, um Army of the Dead, Lost Vegas, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. And you've got the Army of the Thieves as a prequel that's also a, an, an almost global representation of that, of this universe, which is, to me, is just fantastic. So, you know, how is it like to work on so many different things now and like have, have your hands busy with something new and fresh outside of, you know, the things that you have been working on for the past 10 years as a production company? I mean, for me, the fun of what's happening right now with the army universe is to have multiple projects in the same universe that there there's no established canon for that are all being developed at the same time because we had we obviously were the furthest down the road with with army of the dead but the other two came online while we were still in some form of post production or production even and to be able to let those inform each other as they evolve like zach and you know had come up with a pretty solid story throughout like all those 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 different avenues but to allow them to inform each other as we were bringing the other things online was a ton of fun it was a great way to world build and also the fact that they 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 reach into different areas of tone or genre um even different you know one being animated so it was a lot of fun to have that opportunity to take something that we created in a live action space and and then say okay let's re-envision that as animation what's that look like so for me it was the the things happening in tandem that also had latitude to evolve as we went yeah and i also i mean i have to give netflix credit because to have the faith in us as we were working you know you're working on this big movie and that's like you know you're responsible for this and, and its outcome and how it's received, but to take the chance at the same time before that film has come out and to develop these, you know, spin-offs, these, you know, a prequel. Um, so we get the actually the history of Dieter and where how he became this amazing safe cracker. Um, that's really great. And then we get an origin story uh, with the anime because you know our movie starts like after the pandemic has happened. And we have our crew, you know, is kind of retired and they, it's getting the crew back together. We get to see them when it was like at the height of the zombie apocalypse. Um, so they really all support each other, but they also work independent of each other. You can enjoy the anime or the um, the German film 
and enjoy ours separately, but it's it's really nice how they kind of, you know, fit in. But I've never seen a studio, you know, a lot of times I, I think, you know, what's great about Netflix is these things are getting made, you know, without them, Army of the Dead wouldn't have gotten made the way it is now. You know, mm -hmm. they, they were the ones that stepped up and wanted it and had faith in it. And then they also saw like, how can we, you know, branch this out and, and, and we're like, yes, go ahead, go, go, go. So um, I think it's old and it, it, it's really giving, I think filmmakers exciting opportunities that, you know, we wouldn't have had before. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, well, you've worked with traditional studios up until the point now, now that you're working with the beast that, you know, the amazing beast that Netflix is, it's, it's the most established, um, you know, streaming service. I wanted to ask, how was it like and the differences? And I can tell from Zach saying it, it's a joy to work with them. And for you guys, that freedom that you're talking about, how is it like to work with an established streaming services as opposed to, I don't know, maybe in the last year you've worked with HBO Max, who's perhaps trying to find itself in the market, but how is it like to work with Netflix in that regard and the difference that you've noticed between like the traditional studio with the th traditional theatrical release and then with Netflix with the, now that they've had this alternate, like you have the week, a week in theaters and then exclusive in Netflix. So if you- Which by the way is a big deal because they've never done that not. before. They've done mm -hmm. it with um, some of their like Academy, um, you know, films. But on a big, like, actual film. Um, but I think they see the value in, like, and, and this this film, I think, has the potential. Um, you want to see it in a group. Even if you're watching it on Netflix, I think you want to get your friends together. And it's almost like when we watched Game of Thrones, we would do it, like, in a group of people. Because I think that that collective experience is amazing. Um, mm. Listen, I think, you know, um, Scott Stuber was the executive on Zach's uh, first film. Um, and I think, you know, so he was very aware of like how Zach works and how responsible he is as a filmmaker. And so I think that there was this trust that was there already. Um, but I think the difference is they're just, they're bold and they think about things differently. And even the marketing campaign, which you're just going to start to see some of the things we're doing. And we've done a lot of big marketing campaigns for big tentpole movies. And, you know, Wes and I and Zach all come from that advertising background. So, like, it's an arena that we are, you know, we, we are deep into with, you know, whoever our partner is. But I've just been really impressed with um everybody's enthusiasm but also just the creative ideas that are just a little bit more non-traditional and i think that's the thing right it's like everything is a little bit more non-traditional in the fact of that we have these three properties that are going to get to be released you know most studios because we've had these ideas before and they're like okay well let's see how it goes or like let's wait till the script is exactly perfect and I just think that Netflix is more bullish. Like they, they, you know, they take the chances. And I, and I think, listen, you, you still need to deliver. I think you, as producers, you have a responsibility of delivering on time, uh, delivering on budget, like all those things. And, and also I feel like it's still a partnership. You know, they, they, I mean, you know, we all know Zach has crazy ideas and they really embraced it. But we also work together, you know, with them as a partnership. Um, Ori and Andrew and Tendo, like, have been amazing executives and very supportive. But it's not to say that we don't talk about things and what, you know, I think any good partnership, you know, you have that relationship. But at the end of the day, I think they wanted Zach to have his vision. And and as, you know, producers at his company, that that's our goal. You know, my job as a producer is to get the director whatever director I'm working with, their vision to the screen, you know? And building on that, I think that as producers, having been at Warner for probably, what, 15 years, I think it was, you know, you you develop rapports and relationships and um, you have things that are just the rhythm of how you normally do it. And, and I think for me as a producer, one of the things that was fantastic about this journey with Netflix is I couldn't make any assumptions, A, because it was a new company that we, even though we have relationships from the past with some of the people we were working with, 
the systems mechanisms and cadence of things were different. Also being a streamer versus a, a theatrical scenario, I couldn't make any assumptions and I couldn't assume that we might do it the way we had done it before or on something else. It, it forced me to really sort of blank slate all of the ways that I was looking at each step of the process. And not that all of our past experiences didn't inform that, but it was really refreshing for me because it made me, it's that same thing that when you go on vacation and you're driving down the road and wherever you're at looks fantastically amazing compared to the place you drive through every day. But if you can put that those vacation goggles on at home and look around, you realize you're like, oh, you know what? It's pretty great. And, and I think that it's a, a similar experience here where, if, you know, you get that new, you have to take that new point of view. All of a sudden everything's new and fresh and invigorating. And as a producer, it was a really, you know, fun journey in that way for me. Which, you know, talking about how the pandemic has changed the landscape of media recently, it's been a great journey. And I guess um, it's been a great way for you, for you guys as a production company with Stone Quarry to adapt to the new, to the new demands of the market. So um, like, as a production company in and of like on your own, like how do you envision going forward with any other projects as well? Well, it's interesting because I think we saw it coming like, okay, there's a possibility we could shut down. I don't think we ever thought it would shut down to the extent that it did, mm -hmm. but we were very proactive at the beginning and we said, we should look into what the remote systems are. And I remember everyone was like, that's not gonna happen. And, and we were like, still, I think the second or third person on like um, Runway who plays our avid on their list because people were starting to think we should maybe start thinking about this. Mm -hmm. um, so we got our system set up before, like right as it was shutting down or right before it was shutting down completely. Cause then everything shut down and no one could get equipment or there was a lack of equipment. Um, so we, you know, I think um, we were we were really on top of it, and I I think like how it changed. I mean, listen, we were super lucky that we have um, we have our anime um, for Army, and we're also uh, working on a Norse mythology um, an animated series uh, with Netflix as well, and those just lend itself to being you know you can work on it remotely, and it's and it's quite amazing because you can get artists from all over the world, literally. Like it didn't matter where they were, you know, whereas I think before we were thinking, oh, we're gonna be in an office, we're gonna be in a bullpen and all the artists are gonna be together. Now it kind of opened up the world to us a little bit. So I think that's something that I think will keep. One of the things that like, as we move forward in a non-pandemic world, like the ability to be remote and be a little bit more agile, um, I remember before there was a couple of times where an editor wasn't, they couldn't travel or they couldn't travel for a portion. And we were like, oh, forget about it. And now we're like, okay, well, we just did two movies at the same time remotely and it worked out pretty well. I mean, there's certain things I think, you know, you're doing your final mix or your color, you kind of need to go to those facilities, but there's a lot of it that you can do from wherever you are. So I think it does make the world smaller in that way. And I think that's something as a company that, you know, will, you know, will think about for future projects. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, th I think Netflix as a whole in the way that they're growing um, and the way they view sort of that entertainment market and the, the content market is there is an opportunity just in that space to really explore even just our cast or the cast of the, the prequels, we continue to sort of broaden the footprint of the diversity within those shows. But there's a reality too that as you do that, that your production needs then start to reach wider and further. But I think to Debbie's point, the more comfortable we all get with being able to do things remotely, um, it helps manage some of the production hurdles that exist by having a really broad footprint in terms of where you want to be or where your cast are coming from. And it, it's really just open to a million doors that you can now start to lean into like, what's the most exciting version of the project? And, and the, some of the hurdles with time and distance um, have started to fall off in a way that 
this forced us to get more comfortable with things that maybe before we wouldn't have uh, thought were possible due to distance or or time. So it's it's been uh, a real opportunity to to force us to explore new paths in terms of how we do things. Also, you have to limit your footprint and the amount of people, right? Yeah. I think for us, I mean, the movies got bigger and bigger and bigger. And in a way you get, it's less intimate. You know, I think this movie that we just did, we tried, even though it has big scope and scale, like the crew was smaller, you know? Um, and I feel like COVID made it because you couldn't have that many people. Even when we did some of the additional photography, like there were rules like, and you had to separate people and not that many people could be on set, but it, it, it makes you work a little bit leaner. And I think yeah. like for us, we kind of like that, like the leanness. And I think moving forward, that's another thing that we'll probably, you know, try to keep. Yeah, because I, I think to that point, Zach, you, Zach always talks about that, you know, the bigger the movies get, the further away from the camera you tend to get. And that army got him right back in the middle of the fray where creatively he wanted to be. And I think that that you can apply that ideology to almost any layer of production that the bigger it gets, just the further each of the artisans or department heads or producers get from each one of the elements as you're managing more and more. But as you condense that footprint, as you really create this more concentrated version, it allows you to be more involved, which is important to us because we're super hands on. We travel for the shows. Debbie and I are on set every day. Like we, that's how we produce and, and our normal way that we like to approach things. So by doing this and really condensing things, it's made that more feasible. And, and I feel like we were able to, in a way that was the, some of the most effective being hands-on that we could have done with Army um, was facilitated by that. And I guess like you've spoken about wanting it to be global or like reaching more of a global audience with, um, you know, uh, with Army of Thieves, you've managed to do that globally. But um, I also wanted to ask how, how you find and cast the people that you find for these roles. Like you've got um, Qureshi, she's she's amazing. And like, you've got so many different people from all over the world. And I know that Zach has a phenomenal like knack for choosing actors, but are you guys also involved in that and and how do you find them is it through watching the watching the content that they make or is it through usual casting calls yeah i think it's a combination i mean i i think we looked at some of the shows that you know it's it's amazing um that before netflix i don't think other than like a foreign film in the theater we weren't exposed to content made in other countries and netflix like has there's so much content out there that's being made really amazing content that you know you can watch on the service um so just seeing who those actors were um john papsadero was our, our casting agent and he and his team i think did an incredible job of like scouring like zach had some ideas as to, you know, like he wanted our safe cracker to be German. So we looked specifically at German actors. Um, he wanted our pilot to be a comedian. So we looked in that pool. Like, you know, he always has such a specific idea. And then we would sit and talk about it. You know, we talked about it with John as a team. And then he would present us ideas. And Zach would say, well, maybe a little more like this. Or what about this? And then Netflix also, um, you know, was like, okay, here's some of the shows that are like really popular because they do like, you know, also t pulling from some of the, you know, the successes that they have on the service. And, and there's, and, and there's such great talent to be mined from those shows. So it was kind of a combination of all those things. And like you've spoken about how much of um, an advocate you are for inclusivity, both in front of the camera and behind the camera. Um, working with this, um, with Netflix and just working on this movie in general, did you have more freedom to be able to include that more, more so than other projects that you've worked on in the past where other studios perhaps maybe had more of a hand in that? Or was this always something that you've just amazingly like brought, brought to, you know, evolution through your yeah, work as producers you know we are the ones putting forward and i think we we've 
we're at a level and, and the people that we put forward, we, they don't really question us. And I think like it's our job now. Um, I always say to make these conscious decisions for inclusivity or uh, for having more, you know, women department heads or, you know, we always talk about having strong female characters, especially in these genre films um, or action films. Like a lot of times the female characters are not as dimensional. And, you know, so it's something that we've always, you know, we're always trying to get to. Um, and, and with the hope that someday these conscious decisions will just be what it is, you know, but unfortunately we're not there yet. And I think it's our responsibility as producers to, you know, to uh, be inclusive in the decisions we're making. And, and even to, to build on that, to, to sort of get ahead of that in the timeline of, of filmmakers and department heads, um, Debbie started an initiative many films ago of wanting to bring young women who were um, in school and thinking about filmmaking or maybe hadn't been exposed to filmmaking. So wherever we go, so they can see uh, what it is. Because I think there's a lot of people that have an affinity for movies and think being involved in filmmaking in some way would be great, but it feels unobtainable or um, doesn't have a real world shape. And I think that as soon as you can get someone onto a set and they can look around and see hundreds of people who are engaging with this process in a creative and interesting way, but that there's a there's tons and endless ways that you can contribute to that that process, um, that it, it makes it feel more more obtainable. So Debbie, many films ago, started bringing groups of students, um, and we would have them join for a day and tour and meet with each of the department heads and get an inside peek behind the curtain at sort of each of the processes. And it's been really great. And there's been times where we've had it be a group for a day. And there's been times where we've brought on a person for a couple of weeks and let them cycle through the departments in a hands-on way. So I think that that's another big part of, and that was an initiative Debbie had come up with, that it's not just about when we're hiring, but who are we opening doors to and even seeing themselves as potential filmmakers. And, and it's been a really fun process. It's great to have these students sitting there in that space and to see their eyes light up and look around. But by the end of the day, it goes from surreal to something that they're talking about what it is they want to be doing, which which I think is a great arc in a, a 12 hour day. Yeah, I mean, listen, I grew up in New Jersey and my dad was an iron worker and my mom, you know, was at home with us because that was something that was a priority for her was raising her two daughters. So Hollywood and movies was the furthest thing. I had no connections. I had no, um, I loved movies. And I went to college and thought I was going to be a journalist. And then I realized that I liked actually like putting it all together and, and all the behind the scenes. But if you don't think it's available to you, you know, I to me, Madison Avenue was more available. My friend's dad worked at an ad agency. I could take the train. It was 50 minutes away. Um, you know, it was something I saw and I and I got the opportunity of doing an internship. And that internship changed my life, you know, working in a production department and just watching. And I think if more people, a lot of times, you know, the focus is on the actors or the director or the writers you know, when, when in the news and in the media, but there's so many other roles and there's so many other roles that are available um, on a film set. And I think a lot of times if you're not, you know, growing up in a community that is a filmmaking community, it just doesn't seem attainable. So if we can change that, um, that, you know, hopefully more people can see themselves. Um, actually working on it. Gina, Gina Davis has a, a really great um, uh, foundation and she's done a lot of work with gender equality and she always says, if you can see it, you can be it. And I, I really believe that because it's kind of hard otherwise. And I, I just admire your journey so much and it's such a, it's such a great way for people from all walks of life to look at several different um, career paths. But Wesley, I'd like to know more about you and how you came about um, finding, you know, the amazing Snyders and setting up this awesome company that we're really looking forward to seeing more. more yeah, stuff you know, so. I, I would classify my journey as a combination of amazing people who gave me great opportunities, 
um, timing that worked to help at certain junctures when there were shifts happening in what we were doing. And then just being, you know, taking it on with, with everything I had and, and, and finding similar to what we we're just talking about, finding what it was that I brought to the process that was unique or a strength or, or gave me a particular why in the conversation. Um, and I will argue that I very much like the students we bring to set because I grew up in Michigan, um, had, didn't have any hands-on experience in the film industry other than you know my my university uh, studies. And so the way it happened for me is I had someone, a cousin of mine, who had gone to school with Zach at Art Center, who was producing in the commercial music video space for him, who uh, asked, knowing I was going to film, uh, going to school for film, what I wanted to do. And I said, you know, I want to write, produce, you know. And uh, he said, well, where are you going to do that? And I said, well, I'm working on something here. And uh, he said, I think you should come out on your spring break, come out and just see what a, a set is like. So I came out on my spring break last year of school and worked on a Coca-Cola commercial with Zach as a PA. And a uh, his energy, as we all know, is infectious. So that that set just by itself was enough to convince me. But just the whole journey of that process was was inspiring as someone that wanted to do stuff, something in the creative space and, and with filmmaking. So long story short, we packed up, we moved out. For the first year, because my background was in graphic design, uh, I was put in the art department and had a, a great year being very sort of hands-on in that space. It was a small art department, so was able to get some unique face time with Zach as we were working on these different commercials during that year. And at the end of that year, Zach said, you know, I really want to start focusing my efforts on getting into the feature space. And I, I feel like I need some of this full time that's managing the commercial stuff with me, but also helping you know, clear up some bandwidth so I can focus on that. So uh, I joined him as an assistant and uh, it's 21 years ago, because uh, about a year in. And uh, for the first few years, worked as his personal assistant as we did commercials and tried to figure out the feature thing. We engaged on a few different films. Finally, Dawn happened. Um, and then by the end of that process, with all of our backgrounds in marketing and advertising and filmmaking, Zach and, I, and Debbie and I all looked at each other and we're like, you know, we should be more hands-on with the producing side of it because Zach has really unique visions and, you know, he needs people that are always advocating. Luckily on Don, he had that. Eric Newman was was all in and loved everything he was doing and, and, and Scott Stuber, to his credit, you know, helped facilitate getting that on screen in, in a very Zach-centric way. But, uh, you know, we just felt like, oh, you know, we should, we should, start doing that more hands-on and Cruel and Unusual came into being and we started producing from there. So that was my journey. And I think going back to what I brought to it in, in the beginning that sort of gave me a path was with my graphic design background. It gave me a place where I felt comfortable and confident because I think one of the things that happened for me when I got to Los Angeles was I realized how much experience so many people had and how many different points of view there were and how many just amazing technicians in each sliver of the business there is and it quickly becomes overwhelming and you quickly feel inadequate and then as soon as i started realizing like oh but you know what i bring to it is is this particular point of view that i feel very confident in it gave me a space to exist and grow and and learn the rest of the business um while also contributing so i, I think if there's one thing that i've always said to people in terms of advice it's like find that find that thing that you bring that place where you have a point of view that's additive and, and that you feel confident and, and let it grow from there. Mm. So this question goes to both of you. So you're both producers, but um, and there's so many different elements to producing, but what's your favorite side of producing? And do you ever find yourself wanting to, let's say Zach has this brilliant idea and then you're like, wait, I have an idea too in that creative element. Do you ever find yourself in that position where you want to add creatively to the story or is it mainly the other things that you enjoy so? Both, both of you. Yeah, I mean, listen, we're always reading the scripts and, um, you know, Zach has a very specific point of view, but he also is very, you know, collaborative and opening, open to hearing something that will make it better. Just because it's not his idea, if it's something that's gonna make it better, I think that's what's so great and how he works with all his department heads, you know, in costumes or music or art, you know, like he, uh, he lets them 
be good at what they're you know good at you know he lets them do their craft um and and listen i think it's our job as a producer ultimately it's his vision but um i do not shy away uh from giving my opinion i'm pretty opinionated so i will always share and we debate it but i think the thing that's important at the end of the day is where we come to if he decides that he wants to go a different direction then we're a united force and then we support whatever that vision is we never like undermine that decision um and i think that's so important in the process um for me the shooting is my least favorite part because i think it's the pressure of you know it's a lot of money at stake every day and getting it done and there's weather and like just making sure you can capture it um i i do like though putting the team together like finding who is the production designer who is the editor who is like who are those people because all those people are going to bring something to it and a different choice will make the outcome differently um so i i i really like that putting the team but then I also really like um, post-production. I like seeing it come together. I like the music finally, you know, seeing the visual effects come in, like that whole process to me is, is really exciting. And it's like payoff, you know? <laughs> so that's that's my favorite part. I'll, get, I'll give a, a two-layered answer. And, and the first one's the, the cheating answer where I love it all because I really do. I, each part of it brings a different it asks a different thing of you as a producer and, and engages you in your creative process and, and your producing capabilities or, um, you know, you're just required to address different needs and approach the project from different points of view at each juncture. So, and, and I like each of them. For me, I'm the, the opposite of Debbie on the shooting front because I love the shooting bit of it. And, and, and I think what it is I love about the shooting is I do, I like the challenge within the day of when we get a curveball. It, it does it stress me out? Absolutely. Do I feel like moments of great anxiety when, you know, there's a ticking clock or we have a weather issue? Um, uh, but I, I enjoy that in the moment having to problem solve and especially I, I think I grew into that because at first that was not how I felt about it. After you've spent months and months preparing for like exactly how you thought the day should go and then they never quite do. I think at first I, I saw it as like, where could we have planned differently or planned better? And there are times that that's the case, but most of the time it's like, no, you had a really good plan and you just had to adjust. And, and I enjoy those days. I also just enjoy being out wherever it is on location. I like location days better than green screen days because we've done so many of those every now and then you have, you get to the end of a shoot and you're like, I can't walk onto a green screen the stage anymore. But but I love the just that energy of, of a busy shoot day. And you know, I, I think part of that comes from because we had our backgrounds in commercial as well, is that that has so much of it's it's making a movie on a week and a half schedule, you know? And uh, so I think that we I I grew up in an environment where it was move, 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 fast, fast, fast. So I, I enjoy that pace on the shoot days. That's why we balance each other out, because we like <laughs> <laughs> So with the post-production, um, how was it like with Army of the Dead? I mean, there's it's, it's recapping back to Dawn of the Dead days. And well, I know this movie is almost entirely different, but it's still like, you know, the fun parts of that. And how was it like to just, you know, do the post-production like you said you enjoy um so how was it with army of the dead well we were you know just about to do our first preview for an audience when the pandemic struck so you know it's it's super challenging because you know really a part of the process when you're making a film is you show it to people you we're making films for an audience right so you want to know is uh is there any confusions is it slow in a part like you know you get really close to it because you're seeing it over and over you know you saw it you prepped it you know and then you saw it on the shoot and then you and then you're seeing the scenes and you're seeing it and seeing it and seeing it that you kind of you lose objectivity a little bit um so it was interesting because we had to figure out how to do that like it was all new territory and we did it, you know, on the platform, which was interesting. We did like a friends and family 
we couldn't do a normal audience recruit, but we were able to recruit um, friends and family, extended friends and family of friends of friends, but just kind of trusted people since we were putting it out there, you know, in people's homes, you know, because you're always worried about piracy and things like that. And then we were able to tap into Netflix in not in the cre in people who are developing the films, but there's a lot of people that are working in other areas of Netflix that aren't developing the films. Um, in you know uh, to get enough of an audience and to do a focus group and to get your cards and just to get enough information that we were, where we were headed was the right direction and that people were liking things and that they understood things. Um, so it was it was definitely um, challenging and um, it was challenging. You know, we did the mix and everything for that virtual. So I remember we were all at our places and you're like, OK, should I listen to it on the headphones or should I play it on the TV? <laughs> how are people going to hear it? Like, how do you judge? Because normally you're in, you know, you, you mix it in the best possible like uh, quality. And then, you know, everyone's TV is different. Like you can't adjust for that. But like we were all listening to it in different ways. So, you know, that's why I think we were able to do a lot of that prep work um, virtually, but then there were times where they had to test everybody and we had to go into the studio to do the final final. So it was, it was an interesting process. I was just blessed because a lot of movies were shutting down you know, I was blessed that we were in the post-production, you know, process that we could continue. We could actually deliver this movie. Um, so that was that was great. Yeah. And like Debbie said, you know, earlier, we we I think got just a little bit nervous about the direction, the things were headed in terms of potential work from home requirements and needs. I literally call it days ahead of just the 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 main wave of it and literally four days ahead of it. So we were able to get people in, get them trained on some of the remote systems they hadn't used before, get those systems in place and installed because it was, we literally installed most of those pieces of equipment on a Friday and by Monday was when things were shutting down. And and that said, the good news was everyone had had training on the, the new piece of equipment. We had systems in place. That's not to say though, it didn't take a while for us to find what that rhythm was because it was a completely different way of doing things. And, and also finding a comfort level, like Debbie said, like trying to decide, am I going to listen to this in my earbuds and trust that, or am I going to play it through my computer speakers or I'm going to try and run it through a home entertainment system and finding those sweet spots where you felt like you were getting a good enough perspective on sound or picture or just process. Um, and even just the cadence of meetings when, you know, like how many zooms do we all do in a day now and getting used to that because it was such a different way to engage your creative team all on a screen versus sitting around a room or sitting in the editorial suite and just having a, a casual conversation. Everything was much more structured and it took a while for that to find a rhythm. But, but I think because we had a few things happening at the same time that were all being forced to do that, it shortened the learning curve on it because it was, we kind of just had to find a way to make it work. But then there were days where something would like crash, right? Yeah. Like technology. And it was harder, like if you, if an avid crash, you needed a technician, you could get one out very quickly. But in COVID, it was more difficult or the internet went down. You know, there was, I remember when it was the, um, the protests here in California, the, everything shut down. And we were supposed to be delivering something to Netflix. And you're just like, it's kind of what Wes said about the schedule. And I think, and I, I really agree with this. Like as a producer, you have a plan. That plan is like a living, breathing thing. And, you just, and, and I think during COVID, it was even more evolving. Things would change. And, you know, you, you just had to, you couldn't just get locked into a certain vision you really had to just be open to knowing that this is what it was going to be and sometimes you know it wouldn't go according to plan and what was the new plan mm -hmm. i mean i guess it's, we're just so excited hopefully that this will be over soon and that you can go back to normal but like obviously as you said you might want to balance both both methods in the future like the old ones and the new ones so 
Um, with the things that you've had had to adapt to, and I'm not sure about the timeline, but I believe um, bringing in Tig um, Notaro and having her additional um, film filming um, was just before you you did the Nightmare stuff for Zack Snyder's Justice League, right? So you had already adapted to that style of filming, you know, with the masks and the pandemic. Um, how is it like to adapt to that? And do you think that you can be able to like perhaps start a movie in the next few months, even with um, the pandemic still going on, because there are still some productions and filming going on with the pandemic restrictions. So how was that like for I the think, first time? I mean, we were one of the um, first shoots that Netflix did. They did, I think, two days or one day um, on prom that they needed. and it took them like months to plan those days because it was all new territories. And you know, the unions, we didn't have agree uh, like an overall agreement. So of like what the safety protocols would be. So each, you had to go to each individual union in order to get them to agree with your COVID plan. Um, so it was, it was, there was a lot of things behind the scenes just in the planning that made it, you know, really difficult. And then I think, you know, being on set, you know, with TIG in particular, we were shooting outside. It was so hot. You know, they had all the, um, if you were in costumes or makeup, you know, besides the face mask and then the face shield, they were in full of these plastic suits. And when, and, and honestly, it was decided when we were there, because things were just evolving and changing that like it was actually more dangerous for them because of the heat. There was, it was like a hundred and some degrees a couple of the days we were shooting. And it was just to, to have all of that on your face and then to have this plastic suit trapping, you know, <laughs> your body heat in, it was, it was a little bit dangerous. So we opted not for the suits and had to deal with uh, the unions and the COVID and, you know, like every decision had to have um, that we did um you know it was i was just so happy to see people though because we had been so careful and this was the first time we had people, even if it was at a distance with all of these things but it, it was it was hard and then when we went inside on the green screen you know a lot of people were getting headaches because of the reflections i would get home at like by three o'clock because my the reflection was on your shield and you would try and focus and your eyes didn't know so it was giving some people headaches but you had to if you were on set you had to have that face shield so it was challenging um i think now you know now that there's an agreement and um it, once that agreement was made it made it easier and i think having gone through this and then justice league and then we shot in prague and, and it was interesting because every country you have to follow the country's rules but we took a more conservative approach and used and incorporated the things that worked really well and kept our crew safe because at the end of the day it's about the safety to our cast and crew it's a movie you know yeah. like we don't want anyone risking in their lives we want to make sure and 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 keep the economy going and keep the business going but we have to do it in a safe way mm -hmm. so that said i think that you know some things that we're looking into planning, we're finding it with the numbers, even though people are getting vaccinated all around the world isn't as you know good as it is right now in like Los Angeles. Um, I think it, it you have to kind of decide what production it's safe to do and what you know there's there I think we're gonna people are going back to work, but I think certain productions are are easier to accomplish now than others if that makes sense. There's a lot of resources needed for all the COVID protocols that, you know, the testing and even just the PPE that everybody needs to wear that gets disposed of every day, you know? And I, I think to build on that, I think the good news is, is we, ought, we do know more now than we did, you know, coming through the summer last year in terms of what would be needed, what would be required both in terms of contractually and in terms of agreements, but also just our understanding of things is growing, you know, each time we learn more about the, the current situation. So I think luckily, like, you know, like Debbie said, 
there is a path, but it just, it's about finding that path that makes the most sense in terms of being able to do something safely. And, uh, and I think those opportunities will be there, but I think it, it just, it'll, it takes more time and more, more, more planning to figure it all out. And, and I think flipping back to the other side of that, the good news is I think some of the, the protocol and some of the systems that were in its, their earliest stages last summer, there's a, there's a, a rhythm. People have gotten used to it, the cadences, um, how to facilitate those things. Whereas it was figuring it out coming through last summer. Now it's implementing what's been found to work effectively. Um, so on the, on the end of that, with Stone Quarry, um, we're so we're, we're so excited for Army of the Dead, which um, for everyone watching comes out on the 14th in selected theatres and on the 21st in Netflix worldwide. So um, what are you guys um, hopefully looking forward to? I know you've spoken about King Arthur, you've got Horse, Lati Horse Latitudes um, and that female sci-fi protag series i am up it's been it's ever since you told us that debbie it's just been in my head and i'm just so like is there any chance that it's coming out in the next few years or like what do you have for the next project because we're on board. Uh, it's a little open you know we're we're kind of exploring um viability especially i think during covid you know i think um Horse Latitudes is a little bit more challenging because um, it's a very small budget and it takes place in a lot of remote locations and a lot of those locations, the numbers are really high. Um, you know, listen, I to take this world of Army of the Dead and to build it out has been so exciting. So to do that with, you know, a world that has multiple planets and, you know, that to me, um, you know, something that's wholly original, um, that has a really great, uh, you know, characters and opportunities for, you know, really ama an amazing, you know, worldwide cast. Again, you know, I think that that with the female protagonist, you know, like I, that to me is really exciting. So um, we'll see, we'll see. That's all I can really share at this point. But, you know, I'm, I'm also just really excited that, you know, our army of thieves, Matthias did such an amazing job. You know, his character is so much fun and I can't wait for you to see his character, but to, he's an amazing director too. Like he's such yeah. a talented guy. And um, he did the, this movie, um, it's so interesting to have a movie that takes place in the same timeline in a world where there's a pandemic in the United States, but really this is a romantic comedy. It is to, to have it not necessarily be the same genre, but just be in that world. Um, I think it's really fun. Natalie Emmanuel is um, the female lead and she is just stunning and um, smart and she kicks ass and um, their chemistry is amazing. So, um, you know, it's going to be really great uh, to have that movie. And, and also, I think our focus right now, too, is getting this movie out. And like, we've been working on it for so long, longer than we anticipated. You know, we thought we were going to be able to show this to everybody in January. So the excitement of of this and 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 this really cool world, seeing zombies that we haven't seen before, you know, yeah. seeing them evolve a little bit. You know, um, I think that there's new news because we've had so many zombie films and TV shows, and you know, I think after Zach's Dawn, there was just zombie 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 so what's the new news and i think this has a lot of new news yeah, yeah. there's a lot of like genre bending that you guys do with this with area 51 and like the heist and zombie elements and now that the the um army of thieves is rom-com and heist it's just <laughs> I, I mean i'm in love with the world that you're creating and we're all here for it so um 
Yeah, it's amazing. Um, guys in the chat and, and anyone watching, we are also um, raising money for AFSP as always. So if you can donate, please do so. The links are in the description and in the chat. Um, so I think we have time for one question if Cole is willing to um, come out and bring them. Um, but I just wanted to ask whilst this is, whilst we bring out the questions, what what were the what was one thing or like a few things that you found just fun in terms of like the zombie maybe it was a zombie the makeup the the heist element working with dave or who whoever like whichever actor was gave you something fun during army of the dead sorry you want to you want to go first no, take it i've been blabbing a lot nice i see um for me what was the you know, I think, and again, it's it's sort of the the most obvious answer, but I think anytime you get to play within a zombie infested world and get to, you know, explore those manifestations of zombies, whether they be, you know, uh, there's lots of different ways we approach it, whether it's makeup effects or some of the CG um, that we did. I think just finding, having fun in that zombie world and embracing the, the zombiness of it was a lot of fun for me. I think for this one too, the Vegas of it, like taking these um, these characters that we know that are like just so traditional Vegas, like the showgirls and Elvis and Liberace, and then turning them into zombies, like that that was super fun. Um, and of course, the tiger, like yes. I mean. Valentine. Valentine. It's like Valentine. you know, so much a part of Vegas. When you think of Vegas, is Siegfried, Siegfried and Roy and their white tigers. So, like to have you know, Zach always. We wanted to have zombie animals, <laughs> and um, it was funny though because we talked about like, is there going to be you know? Because I think like. Uh, one of the hotels has like a lot of like birds and we're like, well, that's problematic because a zombie bird can like, you know, fly and like <laughs> spread it. So we're like, I don't know, we're not gonna deal with the zombie birds, but definitely the zombie tigers and the police horse, which is the horse that we see Zeus on, which we feel, you know, he was one of those, he would be, you know, walking the streets of Vegas, like on patrol. So that was fun. I want whatever genetic anomaly those birds have in their genes that, you know, in this universe, I want that genetic anomaly now. Um, but yeah, um, the, the Valentine has stole everyone's hearts in like, like that. As soon as we saw Valentine. We, we, we all like, want a yeah. pet ti zombie tiger now. And by the way, you know, I, I don't know if you know, I think we mentioned this once, but, um, Valentine is based on a real tiger. And our visual effects people um, called a lot of animal sanctuaries to see if they can, if they could, you know, video uh, the, a tiger as reference. And can you guess who's tiger? Valentine. Carol Baskin. Yes! No <laughs> I knew it. And by the way, I didn't, it was before, it was before no Tiger came out. So it was kind of wild. And I remember um, Marcus, our visual effects supervisor, spent some time, like like a week down yeah. there. And we're like, well, at least you got out alive. <laughs> wow. So like it's <laughs> oh, a so. crossover of Tiger King and Army of Ted. Wow. We didn't even know at the time. So it was, so it was so kind of, uh, and I remember here. watching it. Oh my and God. Then, it wasn't until later, and Marcus goes, "You know where Valentine came from, like right? His his origin or his the model, you know." And you're just thankful that your per the person you sent down there got out in one piece. <laughs> you're like, so you're not buried next to her husband. That's that's good. <laughs> Good news, guys. Um, we've raised so far twelve thousand and one hundred and sixty dollars. So keep the donations coming. Oh, and amazing. Keep them coming, and it's for an amazing cause. The early panel with AFSP was really amazing to listen to, and then um, just it's just been such a great three days. So um, just if you can 
please donate. And if you can't, please share. That would be really, really appreciated. Yeah, and it's such an important time right now, like, yeah. you know, for to talk about mental health, to bring awareness to mental health. I mean, I think this has been such a tough year for everybody. So many people have lost their businesses or their job or their loved ones that, like, you know, it's timely. So the, everything you contribute really does make a difference, and and we thank you. And and also, I just want to say a quick thank you to you guys for putting this amazing thing together for these three days. Like, we appreciate um, just the support that you've shown us for the work that we've done, um, and as well as the whole fan base. Like, everybody has been so supportive professionally and personally, and um, we just, it really, you know, it really matters to us, and we really appreciate it. So I just want to thank you. Yes. And the team, um, everybody at the Nerd Queens, because you know, I know it's more than just the two of you, um, but also the fans, because this community is really just Phenomenal. amazing, amazing. So thank you. And it's a, it's a testament to you, Zach, Wesley, and everyone in your teams as well, because it, this is unparalleled. And I'm sure the directors and other creators have a fan base around them, but not to this extent. And it's just a testament to the amazing work and the values and the morals that you guys stand for and the things that you create for us um, as fans, regardless of whether it's superheroes or zombies or sucker punch or even anime with the, the stuff that you're coming and hours of the hours of gold, which is still such a joy. Yeah. Well, it's not even a fan base, it's a community. And I think yeah. that, you know, it's you all have created this community and, um, and I think that's 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 what's really nice about it. Well, thank Agreed. you for showing Not as much love point. to us as we do to you guys. You guys have made it 110% worth it. Like, if it wasn't just for like loving the films and loving what you guys do, loving you guys all as part as people has been nothing but a gift to this community. Hmm. Oh, thank you. Do we have any? questions that you are you okay yes, uh, there's one that i do ha that i have that i was curious about too uh from tari they ask what inspired the name change from cruel and unusual to stone quarry i always said i don't think we're cruel although we might be unusual <laughs> um <laughs> you know it's funny because that was zach's like corporate entity for a long time like prior to us making films so he didn't, we just had needed a company and he was using that, but we hadn't really thought about what it meant as, you know, and I think that we just felt like it was a little too, a little too much. It didn't really define who we were as people or the kind of work that we wanted to do. Um, and we felt like Stone Quarry was like somewhere deep and Starting from the ground up, get made, you know. So um, that that's kind of the, the change of the name. The uh, Kels Kels wanted to ask both of you: Was there a learning curve when it comes to producing an anime for the first time? How is it similar or different to film production? I mean, for me, um, yes. And uh, luckily, we we had done we had created Guardians of Gaul. Um, as an animated feature, we created the Black Freighter, um, and we did some animated motion graphics with Watchmen. So it wasn't entirely new to us. That said, um, as we've begun this journey, a lot of the series mechanisms and timings are, are all new to me. So, uh, so those are all, again, one of those things that's great because it, it forces me to really just take it from scratch and, and understand process and learn process. Um, the flip side of that is just animation as an as an idea and as a general process is familiar to us. So it, you know we were confident enough in that space that we knew how to create an animated piece of content. In, and Zach had a very clear vision for it. And Jay's fantastic in terms of you know his experience, what he brings to it. So we had a, a great team. And uh, but it, it was different. It was learning um, the the sequences, sequencing of series and and how a series is animated versus a feature for me. Yeah, I feel like the series part of it to me, because it was more challenging because it's mm -hmm. just so 
little bit different than our, our normal process. Um, right, you usually also, do films. Yeah, and I think also, you know, our whole team is in Japan. So, um, we, you know, I think the time difference makes it a little tricky, but it's been really, um, you know, it's been fun. We started out all being in the same office. You know, we had space in a building for post-production and then the artists and Jay were right down the hall. So I do miss the fact that it was easier to just like communicate that, that human interaction or like now everything has to be scheduled, right? It's a Zoom right. call or you can try and reach someone, but they're on a Zoom usually. So you have to kind of schedule it where there was a, a little bit of a spontaneity with us being able to just walk down the hall or, hey, can you just come by? Oh, we want to show you what we're doing. And also because it's interconnected, you know, this one. Um, but it's interesting because we're just uh, recording our actors for Norse mythology. And I feel like, and also when we did our records for our army um, anime, because we're doing the pandemic, I think we got better actors because we were able to go, you can do it from your house. We're gonna send you a mic. And, you know, it made it a lot easier. And, and because a lot of the, the filming had shut down, like Everyone's looking for something to do. And, you know, they, they were doing this, you know, it, it, we showed them, we had artwork and everything. And, but I do feel like the pandemic helped us get more talent for the voices because it was something, you know, safe and easy for them to do at their house, you know. Well, ne Netflix has been putting out some incredible anime and we're really excited to see the anime that Zach and you guys have been working on. There was another, uh, there was an interesting question from Rachel who is asking, is there anyone in production or acting who worked on Dawn of the Dead that was able to come on for Army of the Dead? Wes? Yeah, I think <laughs> myself, I think myself, Damon, Damon Caro, and was there anyone else that? Rich? Rich, I think Rich. I think the three of us are the three that would have been so, on so, Dawn. So you didn't grab any zombies from back in the day and be like, come shamble some more for us? <laughs> we didn't, no. There, I, I think that, uh, I think other than than Rich, I think you'd be the only one that would be in that space. And by the way, Damon had a little zombie cameo in Dawn as well, now that I think about it, so. Yeah, his head was in the cooler, right? Yeah, in the like credits. heads and things. We had the queen's head in the... Oh, I can't say it. I'm not going to say anything about anything. <laughs> spoiler, but uh, but Damon's head is in the cooler. It's good that you once you slipped up. You know, usually Zach is slipping up, and you're re you're calling him saying you slipped again. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it was the thing I was most nervous about today too. Was that because we were just starting to talk about this? There's always that first few times that you get to start talking about the movie, and I get so enthusiastic that I want to, you know. Just talk, like, talk, talk no. about it. So yeah. you're like, no, I can't. We'll have to, we'll have to meet up again sometime after the, uh, after the movie's out. We've all gotten to watch it over and over and over. Uh, speaking of cameos, I wanted to know: Do you guys or Zach have a cameo in Army? Anything and Wesley, you look for? And can I ask Wesley, have you ever cameo? Like, I've seen Debbie in the funeral scene in Batman versus Superman, holding the. The, food. the green bean I've cross, like green yes, bean. Um, well, Wesley, have you ever cameoed? Uh, I was when for the funeral procession. Uh, I'm walking with Debbie through the cornfield in the ultimate edition, uh, and then and I was in the interior in, in the inside uh, setup there, but I, I was off having a, another conversation. Think you see my ear maybe over his shoulder, and then for Watchmen um, in the sequence where Doctor Manhattan is is walking through. Um, the the through Vietnam, uh, one of the soldiers with Zach and Damon and the comedian um, in that sequence. I think think those are the two. But did, well, were the, was there anything you know, we could keep an eye on for Army of the Dead when we watch it? Any even a hand cam? Because we know that Zach has a hand cam. Oh, he's always in BBS. all the hands. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's funny when we did the funeral, everyone was was our crew. crew. Because we didn't want to have any like just day players because the security like you know oh, the no, Superman being dead. So it and and by the way, it was the hardest 
three days. It was I'm so like, cold. And, I yeah. never, it was cold. And it was, I was like, this is really hard work. I yeah. said, I don't really, I want to go back to like, I was like, you know, we were in that cornfield. It was freezing and um, we kept walking and, you know, just the nature <laughs> of the aerials and everything. It was hard. Is, yeah. is that why we, we you, you only have one cameo so far? <laughs> you decided <laughs> this is not for me. I want you my know, parka. I want my hot kind of we, we also, you know, because there's been a few times something's come up. I'm trying to remember what it was on this one. There was an opportunity for me to do something like, oh, you should sit in on this. But we're so busy on set, too, that then it starts to give me anxiety that I'm like, OK, so I'm going to I'm going to commit myself to being in this spot on camera. And then something's going to need my attention and I'm going to be in a pickle where I can't walk away because I'm needed there, but I can't solve this. So for me, it was fun on Watchmen. I didn't think about the ramifications and what I was committed to um, on, on the, the funeral procession. It was required because we just needed our team to do it. And then now I think the, the, I do a risk assessment in terms of like committing myself to, you know, being stuck on camera for something. And, and uh, usually I just shy away from it. So. Yeah, because there's always stuff that you're like loose ends that you're as you're going into the next couple days coming forward, right? That you're trying to, or you know, you're working on budgets like the construction budget like got a little bit bigger, and you're figuring out how to get that down. There's always these fires, and if you're if you're on camera, it is like I felt really anxious too because I felt like, oh my God, what are all the emails like waiting? You know, I didn't have a phone or anything like that on me when we were walking in the fields, and uh, there was a there was a great sense of anxiety. I remember too. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were we cold. Were you were anxious. <laughs> you were watch the movies that you guys make. So the Easter egg hunt is going to be amazing to find you guys. So if you can do more of them, if it's <laughs> not too much, love it. if it's not too much, because it's just nice to see, see it there. Maybe a hand. <laughs> uh, I think though that uh, Fatma, do you have any more questions for our guest? Um, no, but I just wanted to thank you guys so much for your time and thank you everyone to, uh, who has donated. Um, be sure to um, check this movie out on March 14th and selected theatres so um, hopefully you have them around you and on March um, no May 14th in selected theatres and May the 21st yes on Netflix I'm still <laughs> in like that's okay, that's okay. Fatima, um, thank you so much yeah, thank you. All, as always thank you you guys have just put together some really amazing programming for these past couple days. So um, have a good rest of uh, the day today because I know you have Zach and Dave Batista coming up. Yes, so. we've got Dave Batista and Zach, but we have like an hour or so. So go get your dinner and make it back here because you're not going to want to miss these next few panels. Thank you so much, yeah. guys. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye.